Do I read the whole thing or? Yeah, from one to to fifteen. Okay. A man at the pool of Bethesda. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity, who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise up, take your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well took up his bed and walked. Is that all? Up to 15? Up to 15. Uh, took up his bed and walked. Cause Is that up to 15? Oh, no, I haven't finished. Yeah. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Thank you, Batam Blenia. Thank you. So in this story, we see a paralyzed man, paralyzed for 38 years of his life in this place called Bethesda where there's a pool. People go there Every time the water starts rippling, every time the water starts moving, they say an angel came in there and they believe that the the water provided healing. So they went to the water for for physical healing. There's blind people there, paralyzed people there, sick people there, and they all went for healing for the hope of being healed. But this man was there for 38 years waiting for that healing. And he didn't get healed. So Jesus came there and he saw the man and he told him, get up. He first asked him, do you want to, do you want to, so he was He first asked him, do you want to walk? Then the man said, yes. And Jesus told him, get, get your mat, get up and walk. So this is basically the short story we're gonna try to go in a deeper analysis of it and just touching up on some of the things we even said last week Elie you put up your hands what were you trying to say the question is I wanted to ask like you know the river you're talking about right now Mm -hmm. does it still exist the way like was like back in the like you know back in the days it was back then because Jerusalem uh after Jesus died, after a couple of years, Jerusalem was attacked by Rome, the Roman Empire. And like the whole city was destroyed and burnt down and all of these things. And that's one of the ways it became modern day Palestine. Back in the days used to be Jerusalem and uh, the Jews used to live there. But after Rome invaded and attacked and killed the Jews and destroyed almost like half the temple and half of Jerusalem these places were destroyed. I'm not sure if the place still exists right now, but most of Jerusalem, ancient at this time, was was destroyed back then. Okay, but like, you know, where like Jesus was baptized, still there, like, you know, the river in Yeah. It's like on the border of like Palestine and Jordan. 
I don't know if you know about this. Uh, of course, the the Jordan, the Jordan. Like, 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 there's like a river. The Jordan between. River. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jordan, like you know, it's like, it's like Jesus got baptized, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. But you know, that's not uh mm. property. That's like natural, a natural river. This oh, was no. like literally a place where people used to go. There was a swimming pool and stuff. Okay. Okay. I got you. But very was good this, question, though. Was this man-made? Yeah. I, okay, if it's man-made, though, it doesn't mean it's back then because everything, m- most things about this religion are man-made. What, Elisha? I don't understand your question. I mean, I mean the question is, like, it was, like, this river is man-made out of there? No, no, no. The Jordan River wasn't man-made. It, KB's oh, okay. asking if the place right now that we're reading about was man-made. The oh. Bethesda. The pool of, the, of Bethesda. And I'm okay. saying, yeah. Okay. okay. The Jordan River isn't man-made. But, yeah. So, okay, before we go into this, what were you guys gonna... Ailey, do, do you have another question? Or is your hands up from earlier? From earlier. I don't know turn it off. I think you go in and now you press it again. Oh, sure, 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 sure. So, is there any other thing anyone wanted to point out or like ask from this? Or something interesting that you guys found, like that you guys would want to share? Yeah, there was one thing I um, found interesting. Again, my version isn't the same. So Tanisha may sound different. Um, So I think verse 8, no, 10. For me, it's 10. It says, the Jews therefore said unto him, thou was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, he that made me hold this, the same said unto me, uh, take up thy bed and walk. That's Jesus said it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I found it interesting that, like, even, um, like, today, like, other people might have different opinions about how to be a good Christian, Manalman, but just, like, going by what Jesus said is important. That's what I wanted to point out. One hundred percent. That's a very good observation too, because the people, the Jews that he's talking about, they're Pharisees. John, when he when he says the Jews in the book of John, he's usually talking about priests like Pharisees back in the days. They used to be Jews of high renown, the Jews that were like had authority and like had a relationship with God. You know, because just because sometimes we see a priest, we just think, oh, okay, this guy, he's a man of God. And these were those guys. And they came up to him and they're like saying, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But just like Yanni just said, even above priests and even above people of high authority, the word of God always comes on top. What, what God tells us to do, what Jesus tells us to do, always triumphs with other people say we should do or what they want us to do and we're gonna come talk about this a little bit bit more in depth later okay anything else okay this one thing sorry for me for me to clarify mm-hmm, so when we talk about God, like Jesus is God, I don't know. Okay. So I, I just want to clarify so I could like follow, follow the plot. Okay, Alicia. So and and Dom, let's do a quick recap. Let's do a quick recap. On John 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So what is the word? So what is the word? Right? Elisha. 
In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, is what it's saying over here. So what is the word is the is the question. And on John 1, line 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he beheld, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here, clearly, he's talking about Jesus. Hey, Delu, how are you doing? Uh, he clearly, here is talking about Jesus. Adela'ili, the word became flesh. So the word became like saga, flesh, and started walking. So what's the word exactly? The word is Jesus. Okay. You see? So Jesus God? No. Yeah. Sorry if you have to take me time to understand. Can you? No, no. No, Eli, that was a perfectly written question. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So now, Delu, uh, we're on John 5. We're reading John 5. We just read from line 1 to 15. And uh, we're about to just analyze it a little bit. So. Okay. I should do. So let's go. What I found interesting about this, and I was saying this last week, was uh, now they're in Jerusalem on line 2. On John 5, line 2. Get that. It says. No. No. Wait. Hmm? Give me a second. Uh, on John 5, line 2 says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. So, okay. So this pool is near this place called the sheep's gate. The sheep gate. And. This has significance that we're supposed to look at. So what is a gate even to begin with? We all know a gate is an entry and exit point. So like when you walk into a gate, you're entering something or you, when you walk out of a gate, you're leaving something. So we see this man, the paralyzed man coming to this gate, sheep's gate, near the sheep gate because he thinks that this pool of healing or whatever whatever he's in is an exit point of the torment and the pain that he's in and an entry point to a new point of his life, you know? And this man is here sitting down at this false gate, this gate that he thought would be an entry to something new, to healing, to all of these things. But he wasted eight, 38 years of his life hoping to get healed. And when I was reading this, it just, there's a lot of symmetry between this guy, parallels between this guy, the paralyzed man, and us. Just like him, we go to false gates thinking that they can help us exit the current life that we're living in and enter a new one. thinking that they can give us something, a healing that we don't have. So if this is a false gate, where's the real one? Is a question that I would like to ask you guys. And this gate, this guy probably came to get away from, of course, his physical pain, his physical sicknesses. But second, his feeling of worthlessness, his life anxieties, because he can't do anything first thing first, you know, when you're crippled back in the days, it was, it was very deep, like, what can you do? So what did this man come to... I mean, uh, so where is the real gate? Where is a gate that we can enter and be completely changed? A gate that can provide us with healing and all of the things that we need. Okay, KB. KB, shall you, you raised up your hands? Awesome. Yeah, I'm just going to give somebody else a chance. <laughs> 
Okay, who who would want to, to, to take KB up on that offer? Um, I guess I'm gonna go. Um, the gate was the, the man who healed them, which was Jesus Christ. Exactly, exactly. Let's quickly turn to John 10. John 10, verse 7 and 11. Yanit? Okay, so my question is, but he got to meet Jesus. That He was the gate for him because Jesus came to him. And Who's we're gonna, the gate for me? What's the gate for you? Yeah, yes. Jesus is also the gate for you. Okay. Well, a very, a that's a very gate. valid question, by the way. What? What? Now, what's the gate for me? Because Jesus met him. And I think we're going to see that as we read more. As we read, we're going to look at that gate. Okay? Okay. But um, I think a pre-answering your question, is I think Jesus is also our gate. But we're, we're going to look at that. So right here on, on John 10, line 7, it says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Look, on John 5, 2, it literally said, By the sheep's gate. Do you see? So all of us are sheep of God. All of us are God's sheep. All of us are God's sheep. But we need to enter through the gate. And the gate is Jesus Christ. And over here. Sorry, guys. I'm the OD. Uh, pray for me, you guys. I'm actually, I just have to go and see. You pray, all of you guys pray for me. Don't forget okay, me to pray. Yeah. When you finish, <laughs> we'll pray for you. Yeah, yeah no. When, I, when you finish, pray for me. And now, don't forget me. Love you. Love you too. Love you too. Love you too. Love you too. Love Okay, so what were you saying? Lost the train of thought, but so Jesus is the gate. So this guy came to a false gate looking for healing, looking for all of these things, and he's been there for 38 years of his life, wasting his time. But Jesus says on John 10, line 7, he says, Then Jesus says to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. We are his sheep. That guy who was there for 38 years, he was a sheep, but he was at the wrong place. And we're going we're gonna to talk to, we're going to come to how do we be, how do we go to the right place? But uh, let's just continue reading this John 10, 7, 8. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. So do you see what he said? All who have come on line eight, he says, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. So what do thieves and robbers do? The Bible says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, just like what he was doing to that man. He was stealing his time, slowly killing his body, and interior, internally destroying him, his hope, his faith, just him as a person. You guys get me? And we go to different gates in life. Some, some of those gates might be drugs. You know, some of those gates might be relationships. We're just trying to find healing somehow. Maybe we feel lonely. Maybe we feel like there's something more to life. And we all go to different gates. But those gates, they only do three things. They steal, kill, and destroy us. Slowly stealing our time. Slowly killing us. Slowly destroying who the people we are meant to be. Who God had called us to be. So we see this. And we see that Jesus, Jesus is the gate. And we also see Jesus coming to the man. And the man entering in him. But we'll, we'll, let, we'll, we'll go there. So 
Let's go back to John 5. And in John 5, on line 4, something that was so interesting to me when I was reading it is, on line 4 says, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, just keep in mind, stepped in first. After steering of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. When I was reading this, I was like, what? Stepped in first. This guy is paralyzed. Is he like, in his case, he would crawl in first. But the key word there is step and first. So there's other people that are going to be doing that. Other people that are going to be running to the water to get healed. But this guy, knowing that he had to, you know, compete with other people to get into the water first. Because the, the people who get healed in this is the people who step into the water first. But he still went. He still went. Even though deep down inside, he might have felt like, I'm paralyzed. There are people who, who are sick, but they can walk. They could run into the water. I'm paralyzed, but there's people who can get there before me. And we even see this because... What does he say to, to Jesus on line seven? He says, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. So he, he understands that there's other people that are going to go before him and get healed and that he doesn't have much hope. But why is he there? Why was he there for, 36, for, for 38 years of his life? That's one thing that I found very interesting when I was reading that. And the same way, like, deep down inside him, inside of him, he knew that this place wouldn't heal him, but he was still there for 38 years. Some of us are struggling with the same thing. The things we're doing, we know deep down inside, God is telling us, convicting us. Our conscience, or through his spirit, he's convicting us, telling us, you know this place is not going to heal you. You know this, what you're going to, what you're doing right now is not going to bring you healing. It's not going to bring you peace. But we're doing it. We're doing it. Do we need, let's learn from this man. Do we need to waste 38 years of our lives learning this lesson that there is only one gate that can heal us? that there's only one gate that can bring us to peace, joy, complete healing, take away our anxiety, all the depression we face. There's only one gate. That gate isn't medication. It isn't like, don't get me wrong, of course, take, take everything, but there's one true healer, one true one, the one who heals, and that's Jesus. And this is where... Yanit, where, where we're going to go to what you asked earlier. Where, what is my gate? You, you, you asked me, right? So let's go to that. And on line six, it says, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And do you see? The thing is, the guy didn't see Jesus. The guy didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus saw him. And Jesus saw him in his suffering. Jesus saw him when other people were walking over him, when people were stepping over him. And just like that, the gate came to him. Just like that, God sees us in our, in our, in our suffering and our struggles and the things we struggle with. He sees us. It's not us that get his attention. He already sees us in our suffering. But he's going to let us suffer until we realize that that is not going to heal us. That we need him. We need the true gate. We need the true gate. And how do we know that this man understood this? When he asked, when Jesus, when Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? The man 
the sick man answered Jesus saying, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. And then Jesus didn't try to pick him up to put him into the pool. He said, rise, take up your mat and go. So you see this man would truly in his heart, he was waiting for healing, but not for someone to come pick him up, put him in the pool. So just like that, God is looking at us, looking at us until we understand that the gate that we're in right now, the things that we're looking at right now for healing is not the things that are going to heal us. And we just turn to him and look at him and just ask him for healing. Step into him. Step into his, into Jesus, which is the gate. And once you step into Jesus, once you step into him, you exit the reality or the whatever circumstances that you're in. And you enter a kingdom, the kingdom of God. But it's deeper than this. And we're going to see how deeper it's not as simple as just walking into a like, walking into a gate, but like we're gonna we're gonna talk about how deeper it is. Because we see this man. We see this man. He was living in his circumstances. You see? He Jesus said, take up your mat and go. In other translations, it says, take up your bed. You know, even on this translation, it says, take up your bed. On other translations, it says, take up your mat. So you see that this guy made his bed there. He made his bed. He built a house in the, in the situation that he is. In his pain and his suffering and all of these things, he built a house and he's living in those things. He's living in his pain. He's living in his suffering. So many of us subconsciously do these things. So this guy, he lived in that area. His, his circumstance became his, his place of residence. And his disability became his identity. Do you, do you see that they didn't even call him? They throughout the whole thing they knew him as the 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 paralyzed man. His character was literally paralyzed. The first thing you even hear from his mouth was, "They're doing this. I couldn't do this. I don't have this." You know, and this man's disability became his identity. So many of us, just like this man, live in our traumas, live in our past abuses, if we've, if we've ever had abuses, live in our, you know, like, in, in our darkness. We make our bed there, we make our house there, we live there. We live in our anxiety. We don't just face it. We don't just face it or experience it. We live in it. Just like how this man is living in his situation. Wait, at the end. And we see that Jesus comes to him and he asks him a question. He doesn't even say, you're healed. He asks him a question and he says, do you want to be made well? Why, why does Jesus even ask him this question? Isn't it obvious? Isn't the guy there? Hasn't he been there to be healed 38 years of his life? Why do you guys think, let me ask you guys this question. Why do you guys think Jesus is asking him this question? By the way, please uh, let me know if I'm making sense. 
or if you guys have any any other things that you guys would like to say to to that doesn't make sense or like to add or something. You're making sense and makes sense. Hi. Are you actually making sense? Okay, I appreciate you. Thank you. No problem. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, for your question about why Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? Because I feel like sometimes um, we try to, we do something, but hold, not wholeheartedly. Sometimes deep down you don't, maybe you may not want something. And maybe Jesus was making sure, even though he's God and he knows. Well, 100%. Thank you, Betta. So basically, just like what Yannick said, I believe any personally, I understood that Jesus asked him this question for two reasons. One is God's nature to always ask. God will never force you to do something. God will never forcibly heal you from what you're, from your sickness. God will never be like, you're healed. God, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman's spirit. God is a love and, God, and love doesn't force. Do you understand? So God will never force you into doing something you don't want to do. What God will never force you into following him. God will never force you into loving him. God will never force you into doing anything you don't want to do. He won't force and he won't force healing upon you too. Just like that. So this question even shows the nature of Jesus. Because Jesus, every time he healed people, not just this time, but every other time he healed people, he asked them, do you want to get healed? It's your choice to say yes or no. If you want to live as a victim in whatever circumstance you're in, that's your choice. God will give you that choice. And just like Yanni said, the second reason is because some people, like what I just previously said, want to live as victims in their circumstances. Some people are so used to their pain that they don't want to, they, they subconsciously become slaves to their pain. Some people are so, their identity is so dependent on their trauma and the things that they've experienced that they can't, you, they can't even imagine of a version of themselves, a better version of themselves without these things. So I feel like God even, Jesus even asking him this question is also asking us a question. Do you want to be made well? So whatever we're praying to God about, God, help me with uh, lust. God, help me with these things. God, help me follow you more. God, help me be more faithful to you. All of these prayers that we're making to God. He's going to ask us, do you want those things to happen? Do you really want those things to happen? Are you just saying it or... Do you really want it? Are you crying for those things or are you asking for them? You know? So, so many of us say, God, do this for me. But we really do not mean it from the bottom of our hearts. God, change me, but we do not want to change. And this is the thing. Hmm. So many people think that why would Jesus even ask this question? But this is a real valid question that we need to ask people. Some people say, you will pray for me because I'm struggling, I'm battling lust. I'm trying to stop like, you know, like the, uh, watching por pornography or something. But the real question for me to them would be, do you really want to stop pornography? Do you really want to stop what you're doing? Do you really want to stop uh, your addictions? Do you really want to stop whatever you're struggling with? And if there's a doubt in your head, uh, a man, uh, if it takes you a second to answer or like whatever, how long it is, then know that truly from your heart, you might not want that. 
And God doesn't just see our words, he sees our heart. So the man wasn't just asking for healing, but he was crying it out from his heart. So some of us are victims and God doesn't force none of us to follow him or to be healed or for anything. So today, let me ask you a question. All of us make prayers to God. God, help me follow you better. God, help me overcome my temptations. God, help me battle the flesh. But the real question is, do you really want what you're praying for? Do you really want the things that you're praying for? You're saying, God, make me follow you more. Do you, do you understand what, what it means to follow God more? It means you're going to lose people in your life. It means you're going to lose friends. Are you ready for that? Or are you just saying, let me follow you more? Just to say, God, I asked you for this, but you didn't give it to me. So we need to think very truthfully with ourselves. Honesty. Honesty with ourselves, honesty with God. And then you start seeing the real things in your heart. But don't hide them from God. Reveal it to God even. If you, if you, if you truly, you know, it's very, very interesting because if, if you want to be healed, but not from the whole, from your wholeheartedly, just tell God, tell him, tell him, God, I want to be healed, but some part of me wants to be a victim. Some part of me wants to stay in whatever I am, like in the situation that I am, that I'm in. And even the, these type of prayers, God accepts. This one guy was like, when Jesus, do you believe? He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Do you see the depth of that prayer? He's saying that he believes, but he's also welcoming God to a part of his life that he's struggling believing in. And he's saying, help me with that. And just like that, we can ask God, God, I want to get rid of this but some part of me loves it. And please help me get rid of that. Please help me com combat that. And you ask that to God and God will, from the bottom of your heart, at least ask that from the bottom of your heart and God will answer your prayers. That's what's been for me at least. And then we go to John 5, line 7. You see, on line seven, what I find very interesting is the man, after Jesus even asks him, do you want to be made well? He, he, he gives him excuses. Like, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when, I, when the water is stirred up, but while I'm going another steps before me, down before me. I'm not saying what we experience, the struggles we experience, the problems we experience is not valid. It is very valid, guys. It's very valid. And all of us face different struggles and different experiences. But the thing is, are we going to let that, are we going to let excuses define us? When God asks us, do you want to be healed? Are we going to say, but God, that's so fun. It's, I, those things are so hard for me to are you or just say yes so what I'm saying is don't when God asks you this don't 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 make excuses don't wait for others to help you just like how he was saying sir I have no man to put me into the pool We have God. We have no need of people to help us in any situation that you're facing. You have the God of the universe. So stay, like, be cautious of making excuses, being victims, and depending on other people to come help you, to save the day.
but the most interesting for, thing for me from all of these is Jesus answer on line eight. He said, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. He didn't say, you're healed. Get up. He said, rise. He gave him a command. He said, rise. Take up your bed and walk. So let's break this up in two pieces. Let's focus on the rise. And we'll, we'll focus on the take up your bed and walk. You see, some of us pray to God. Most of us pray to God. And God has already answered our prayers. He doesn't need to confirm it. He already answered our prayers. And he's telling us, just like this man, rise and see that you're healed. Rise and see what you've prayed for is already answered. If the man did not rise, so what did the man do after Jesus even asked him to rise? And immediately the man was made well, took up his mat and walked. How did they even know the man was made well? Because he decided to rise. He decided to... to actually listen to what Jesus told him. So, this is it. Jesus is not going to tell you, yo, yo, you're healed. You're, the things that you prayed about, I, I already handled it. He's not going to say that. He's going to tell you, okay, you asked to walk? Walk. See that I've answered your prayers. You've asked to, for me to help you with your lust problems? Delete all of the Girls that you see on social media, all of the, you know, whatever websites they use, just stay away from them. Walk the other direction from that. Turn from them, turn to me and see that I've healed you. This man had the chance to not stand up. Jesus said, rise. If the guy didn't rise, if he stood, would he have even known that he was healed? If he sat down, if he, if he remained on the floor, would he had even known that he was healed? This is a question that I was asking myself earlier. So many of us, just like this man, have been already given the ability to walk. Have been, our prayers have already been answered, but we're still sitting down. But, oh my God, where you say, God, let me be a faithful servant to you. God has already put it inside of you to be a faithful servant. No, you just got to walk. You just got to you just got to walk the path of a faithful servant and you will see when it as you're walking you will see that you have been given the ability to become a faithful servant. Some of us are asking God, God, help me overcome whatever you're struggling with. Heal you from whatever trauma that you're healed from. And God has already given us this healing. We just need to walk in it. We just need to once Stop being a victim and just walk in what God has and the things that we prayed about. So just like this man, walk in faith. Stand up in faith. After you prayed, stand up. After you prayed about something, believe that you've received it and walk in it. After Jesus says something, trust in him and walk in it. But So whoever here might, might not be certain they've been praying for something for so long. God, make me a more better servant. Make, make me a more faithful servant to you. He's put it in you. Just start walking in that direction. Reject everything that's pulling you back. Walk into that direction. And now we come to the second part. He says, take up your bed and walk. He doesn't just say rise and go. He says, take up your bed. He says, take up your belongings. He says, take up your house that you've built in this trauma and in this place of victimhood and walk, move somewhere else. He's telling him, get out of here, move somewhere else. Do you see some of us, we, we get up, but we're still living around there. Some of us walk in the prayers that God has answered, but we don't pick up our bed. We don't pick up our belongings. We don't pick up, we don't move from there. 
Some of you guys, God has given you peace from some traumas that you faced. But you need to move out of there. You need to move your mind away from that and into new things, into greater things that God has called you for. Some of you guys are struggling with worldly things. God has given you, he's already answered your prayers to overcome them, your temptations. But you just got to move. You just got to go away from this place of sickness that you're in, this place of anxiety and helplessness that you're in and move there. Pick up your bed and walk. But when you start doing this, when you start picking up your bed and walking, you'll see something interesting even. But before that, when God answers our prayers, you know, like when we pray for patience, I heard this saying, and it's really, it's a very, very good saying. Uh, when you pray for patience, God doesn't give you patience. He gives you the ability to be patient. Or no, he gives you a situation in which you can be patient. You see? So when you pray for, for strength, God gives you in a situation in which you can be strong. Let me, let me explain this even better. When you pray for money, God doesn't give you money. He gives you the ability to make money. And there's a scripture for this. Wait, let me, let me look for it. It's in Deuteronomy, but we're in Deuteronomy. Give me one second. Because this is a, a very helpful scripture for anyone who's thinking about business and stuff like that. Uh, but it's in Deuteronomy 8, ver uh, line 18. And I'll read it for you guys. Wait, I oh might. It says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms your covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So you see so many, so many of us are waiting for God to put our prayers on our laps, but he's not going to put it on our laps. He's going to put it in front of us. We're going to have to stand up and walk and get it. People say, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God. And I, I'm the biggest person who says this, like 100%. God is the one who strengthens us. God gives us strength to even follow him and to follow his word and to listen to him, all of these things. But you have to get up and walk, just like the crippled man. God gave him the ability to walk. The crippled man didn't heal himself. God healed him but he had to stand up and walk to even know that he was healed. So whatever you're praying for, walk in it, do it, and see what God does. After taking your bed, don't go back there. The crippled man, there's no reason he would go back there. Don't go back there. Leave it. Leave it in the past. Okay? Leave, start living somewhere new. Change your environment. And then what earlier Yanit said, and we're going to see this here. On line 10, you see the Pharisees came up to him. Uh, the Jews uh, came up to him. On line 10, the Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Do you see what pressed them? What pressed them was the fact that he was relocating from his area of darkness. He was moving to somewhere better in life. And this is the same thing that's going to happen to you in life. When God heals you from all of your situations, when God heals you from the traumas that you're facing, when God heals you from the people, from the dark places that you're in, Satan, the first thing he's going to do is going to send people. He's going to send his advocates. They're going to be like, who told you to do this? Is what you're doing right? 
they're going to bring doubts to your head, doubt to your mind. And this is what Yanit was saying even earlier. Beyond them, above them is God. And at the end of the day, we listen to the word of God, not the word of man. We listen to what he says, not what they say. So, if people are coming against you, if people are coming against you, let that just be a testimony that Satan is working against you. Don't let that push you away. Don't let that. Don't, those people wanted him to go back to the place that he was. You see, the, the thing that they said is, who told you to, to pick up your mat? Who told you to, to pick up your bed? Who told you to move, get your stuff out of, out of here? They wanted him back. They wanted him back there. So don't let people push you back. Peer pressure, the feeling of missing out on stuff, all of these things, don't let people push you back to the place that God saved you from. Yeah. John 5.14, afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, least a worse thing come up upon you. You see, conclusively, our prayers, all of the, our healing, everything we receive from God, is to point us to one thing, to him. Point us to Jesus. Point us to Christ receiving him and not leading a godly life. People are finding it hard to live godly lives, lead godly lives. It's because you don't understand. It's because there's a secret to it. It's not you, it's the Holy Spirit. Just like how we pray for, just like how the man prayed, uh, just like how Jesus made the man walk, God makes us walk in, in a righteous way, in a, in a righteous lifestyle through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. We all have the Spirit of God. If you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross and your sins are washed clean through his sacrifice, that you are saved now just because you believe, just because you believe in Jesus Christ, then God sends you the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God helps you walk righteously. Just like God made that man walk, God is going to make us walk righteously and we trust in him and we walk just like this man. We were paralyzed. We couldn't walk in a righteous way. Righteousness for us was, to God was dirty rags. It says that in Isaiah. It says, God says to us, your righteousness is like dirty rags. So just like this man, we were crippled. We couldn't walk in a righteous path. But God, through the Holy Spirit, gave us the ability to walk in righteousness. So when God answers our prayers, all of these things, they should be furthering us in that journey of righteousness. So, yeah, for this, for this bit, that's literally it. But on line 15, it says, then the man, departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Wow. Can we keep silent? Can we keep it to ourselves? The love, the grace, the peace, the joy that God gives us. This man, after he knew that it was Jesus who healed him, he went and told him, it's Jesus who healed me. It's my Lord who healed me. It's my God who healed me. Just like that. 
we have been healed from sin. From a much worse faith than being paralyzed, we have been healed from sin. Because you know why, why I say much worse faith than being paralyzed? Because the Bible says it is better for you to crawl into heaven than to walk into hell. We have been healed from a greater sickness than, par than paralyzation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And just like this man, we have to go, we have to be able to say to people, my Lord healed me, Jesus healed me, his blood healed me, his sacrifice on the cross healed me, my God healed me. And yeah. So let's read the next couple of, of lines and let's break that down. But how's this so far? Is there anything you guys want to add or want to say about it? Nothing to add. Or any questions, at least. Are y'all here? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. I okay, am. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, Anita. Okay, so let us just continue. On to the next part. 16 to, to 30. 16 to 30, I think that would be good. So, uh, who wants to read this? Blaine read the earlier one, so someone who preferably from line 16 to 30. Sixteen to thirty. For this reason, the Jews, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, "My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him." Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever, for whatever he does, and the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Should I continue? Yeah, continue until line 30, keep saying. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for the hours coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the father who sent me. Amen. 
Thank you, Madam Kebisha. What you guys find interesting about what we just read? Because it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting. But not gonna lie, I didn't spend that much time on this part of it. So like I won't have much to say about it. So I'd appreciate if you guys would have had some stuff to say about this. I can say something. Oh, oh. I'd say unity. Rafa, man, go ahead. Unity? Yeah, Chris, explain more on that. Oh, okay, I'd say unity between uh, Jesus and God because Jesus says uh, the Father is in him and he is in the Father. Whatever the Father can do, he also can do because he has been granted the authority by God. So I think it shows that he is the son of God, but he is also God as one united. I don't know how to explain it very well, but I understand you. Yes. Just like that. And what, what, which line does it say that even on, he explains that he says on line 18, it says, therefore the Jews thought all the more to kill him because he not only before the Sabbath, he, he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father making himself equal to God. So Icarus, well, exactly what you're saying. Jesus was claiming to be equal to God. That's why they killed him. That's why they killed him. Because he was claiming to be the son of God. Being the son of someone means you're in part equal to them. He says, me and the Father are one. If, if that doesn't equal, if, if that doesn't show an equal sign, I, I don't know what would, honestly speaking, but. And KB, what were you about to say? Mm, I have nothing. Okay, KB, Sean. What I find interesting is, you know, we are children of God. Hmm? After Jesus died on the cross for, for us, we, he made it possible for us to become children of God. By the washing away of our sins, it says, and I don't know if it's in Romans or in Galatians, but it said, we are adopted into sonship. We are adopted by God. We become his children through Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we become children of God. And if, if we become children of God, doesn't it mean we also have to do what, what our father does? Doesn't that mean we also have to resemble our father? What did Jesus say to the Jews? He says, when they said, we're children of God, he said, no, you guys aren't children of God. You guys are children of Satan. You guys are children of the devil. Because the devil lies and you guys are liars. You see, what they were doing was mimicking what their father is doing. They're lying and they're mimicking Satan. They're making, mimicking the devil. And when we love, God is love. When we love, we mimic God. When we love, we conduct ourselves as children of God. When we walk righteously, we're walking like our father just like Jesus, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in the like manner where I tell you, we're children of God and whatever God does, he loves, he cares, he's kind, he's compassionate. He He's, he wants peace, not violence. All of these things, we're supposed to walk in them as children of God. So if you find yourself stealing, if you find yourself 
always creating conflict between people. You know, gossip, all of these things. Who are you resembling? Are you resembling your father? God? Or are you resembling your father? The devil. You see? This is the thing that we need to, we need to understand. We are saved by Christ, yes. Salvation comes through faith, yes. And we're going to talk about that later on, a little bit more even on this chapter. But we need to walk as children of God. We need to keep. We need to keep in it. We need to walk in the way of love. We need to remain in God. We need to produce fruit. The fruits of the Spirit, the joy, peace, love, self control all of these things and we do this not by mm, i have to I have to stay away from the, mm, not by doing like not by our own strength but by his strength just like how the man walked god is gonna raise us up to walk in this manner we just have to faith believe in him and stand up and start walking in it do you guys get me we need to stand up and start walking in it we're children of god so when people look at us, they need to see God is in our lives. They need to see God has touched us. Yeah. But, oh, wait, wait. And also one thing that I found interesting is uh, on line 17, it says, but Jesus answered them, Father, my, my father has been working until now and I have been working. I never deep this, but now when I'm reading it with you guys, I'm just like, wow, does this mean I can't be lazy? You know? And it's not about cans and can do's. It's just, you know, you wanna be, we wanna be like our father. We wanna be like God. That's that's my that's what I want. I wanna look the most like Jesus, like God as as much as I can. I want to bring people to God. You know? And when you just, when you want to become more and more like him, when you want to become more and more like Jesus, and when you pray for it, I believe just God just starts slowly doing these different things in you. Putting these different desires to even be more like him. And now when I read this, it convicts me of laziness, of not being lazy. I'm not saying it should convict you guys, but I'm saying it's convicting me of laziness. But, yeah. So resemble the Father. And on line 22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. When we... When we die and we were raised from the dead for judgment, you know, when you die, you don't go to heaven, by the way. You, you sleep and all of us get resurrected together. All of us get raised from the dead to face judgment. Then there's heaven and hell after that. People think right now when they die, they're going to go straight to heaven. Yeah. Sorry to break it to you, Yanith. Okay, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> Let me explain it again. Uh, so when we die, death is called the sleep in the Bible. And when we die, we sleep. We don't go to hell or heaven. We sleep. Then when Jesus comes, everybody together is resurrected. Of course, not everybody. Some people, uh, uh, this is going to be very uh, long and very deep and thin. But let me keep it simple and short. Everybody's going to be resurrected together. The final resurrection. Everybody's going to be resurrected together. And they're going to face judgment. And the, I feel like I'm giving too much information right now. Like, Yanith, is this like... Because I'm going to start going into the new heaven and new earth. The earth becomes destroyed. The earth, earth and oh. heaven gets destroyed. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth that will be created. 
And we, after the judgment, we go to this new heaven or like new earth, whatever. We, mm -hmm. we, these are the things that we, we, we live in and we walk in. So, oh, wow. I did not know this. I thought when Jesus comes again, like we will know our permanent, like where we'll be forever. But till then, whoever goes to heaven goes to heaven once you die. I no. guess not. Wow. No. You don't go to heaven once you die. You just sleep once you die. But yeah. Uh, so Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, he will be judging all of us. He will be judging all of us. And the thing is, he's not going to say, you did this, you did this, you did this. He's going to be so powerful. His presence is going to be so overwhelming, so pure, so perfect, that when you come in front of him, you will lay out yourself. You will say everything that you've ever done. Be In his eyes, you'll be naked. Everything you've ever done will be in front of him. You see? So this is what people, what I, what, when people say, uh, I... Uh, I, where do, when I tell people, where do you think you're going to go, hell or heaven? They say to me, um, I would like to say heaven. I say, why? They say, because I'm a good person. How about all the best things you've ever done in life? You see, we've done bad things and we might have done a lot of good things in our lives. But does the good things cancel out the bad things? No. These things are still there, and we still need punishment from the, for, for those bad things that we've done. This is why we can never earn our way up to heaven. This is why, just like the, the, the man, the paralyzed man, he couldn't heal himself. God needs to heal us. God needs to bring us to heaven. God is the only way we can enter heaven. By his kindness and by his grace, which he has demonstrated through Christ. So in judgment... Unless the only reason you might even believe that you're going to heaven is not through Christ, then you're not going to heaven. Sorry, this is, this is the sad part of reality. Unless we believe that Jesus died for our sins, there is no heaven for us. But if we believe that Jesus died for our sins and our faith in going to heaven is only that, is only Jesus, is only God's goodness, not what we did, our goodness, but his goodness. Then we go to heaven, just like the man, the paralyzed man. The only reason he, he got up was not because he believed all of a sudden he could walk. No, it was because of Jesus. He believed what Jesus said. Get up. He believed that there is something. Something happened. Something different happened. This man, let me believe in what he's saying. Got up. He was healed. Just like that, the only thing that can get us to heaven is faith in Jesus Christ. But online 24 talks about that. So let's, let's, let's see that. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. You see, what did he say? He who hears my words and believes in him. He word believes in him. Who sent me. So you have to hear his words and believe in his words and in God and in him. If you believe in God, you believe in Jesus because he says, those who honor the those who honor the father those who honor the son honor the father those who do not honor the son do not honor the father you would believe in the things that i'm saying if you were of god you would believe in the things that i am telling you he says this jesus but if you believe he thing believe christianity the only currency that works is not money is faith faith is the only currency in christianity Faith is the only thing that can get you into heaven. Faith, and not in yourself, but in Jesus. In Christianity, the more you rely on faith for everything, the easier it becomes. The more you rely on faith to, to, to even combat sin, you pray and you're like, God, help me with this. And you believe in your heart that God answered your prayer. That's it. The more you trust in God, the more you believe in God. Sometimes I, I face the worst 
spiritual warfare ever, sometimes for me personally. And, and I first the worst spiritual warfare that I've ever faced. And I'm getting beat up by spirits, I feel like. It feels like that. But I'm just like there, thoughts bombarding me, everything. And I just say, God, you know what? Right now, I feel like I'm not like so much is happening. And I feel like I'm not going to make it type of thing. I feel like I'm going to fail you type of thing. I feel like I'm not enough and I'm not going to be enough. But I trust you. I didn't get here by my own ability, but you got me here. I got here because of you, not because of me. So God, I just trust you. Whatever I'm facing right now, I know not me by my own strength, but you will get me out of it. Whatever I'm facing right now, the battle that I'm facing, you will get me out of it. I say these things. And I just see a shift. Sometimes when, you, when you've lost all hope and you're just like, God, it's all in your hands. I'm not saying you need to lose all hope for you to say that. Please say it before you lose all hope. Okay? But trusting in him, trusting in him that he will continue the work that he has started in you is the way to go in this journey with God. So my words and believe in the one who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is not coming. And now the hour is coming. And now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God. And those who hear will live. We were the dead. Do you guys know that we were once dead in sin? We didn't, once we didn't know God, even though we grew up in Christian families, like we, we hear of God, you know, there's two, there's three things, by the way, guys, and I'm going to talk about this Thursday, hopefully I'll pull up, there's three things, there's three types of people, the people who know about God, they hear about God, they hear about him from their family, from their church, from their priests, they hear about him, they know about God, but they don't know him, there's the third person, the second person is the people who know God. They know him. They know his word. They know him. So many people are in the first category still. So many people know about God, but don't know him. So many people know God. And the third, no, a few people know God. And fewer people, the last ones, these are the rare ones. Fewer people are known by God. When I say are known by God, I mean in intimate ways, as friends. So, which one are we? There is a parable about that, about planting seeds. Thank you, Dedlo. You're right. The hearts, the, the planting seeds on the different types of soils, yeah. But so many people know about God, but not a lot of people know him. Not a lot of people know him. The dead, it says on line 25, when the dead hear, will hear the voice of the Son of God near the end. Uh, this is near the end of that line, line 25. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So we heard the voice of the Son of God, and we are living because of that. Somehow, some way, the grace of God, the kindness of God, thanks to him, not because of anything we've ever done to deserve this, but thanks to his kindness, he touched our hearts and we're all here learning about him. His grace, Kebisha.
I'm sorry, Lee. Finish your point. Oh, go ahead. No, his, uh, that's it. his grace. Thanks to his grace. Not anything we've ever done. We're here. We heard. So in, in our spirit, somehow, we just started believing that Jesus died for our sins. Yeah, KB Shaggy. I was about to say, um, I thought it was very interesting that in line 25, or like 24, 25, it says, he hears my word. <clears throat> he hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And then and then down at 30, 30, no, 28, I think. 28, it says, the hour is coming in which all who are in graves will hear his voice. And now I wanted to I wanted to ask you about like you know the distinction between these two. Well, okay, we. Thank you very much for even bringing that up because I was literally debating this in my mind. I was like, should I talk about this? Should I not talk about this? Should I? Would it be useful information? Will it not be useful information? Okay, so what what line was it, KB? And the the grave part. The grave part, I think, was twenty eight or. 30. Yeah. Okay. From line twenty six, let me read it to twenty eight, and I'll and I'll talk to you guys about that. It says, "For as the Father has life." in himself so he has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear of his voice will hear his voice and come forth, therefore, who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So, okay. This is going to seem a little bit... Maybe we can just discuss this some other time. Like, or you could just tell me, tell me. No, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to phrase it. I'm trying to phrase it in my. So, okay, when Jesus died for three days, where did he go? Bells, some. I hmm? think he went to. I may be completely wrong, but to hell. Not to hell, hell. He didn't go to hell, but he went to the bosom of Abraham in Nepal. Oh, what is that? Okay, so, and. And do you know? Do you guys know the story of Lazarus the beggar? Yeah. So okay, before so the question here is, where do people who die in the Old Testament go? Those who didn't, you know, who don't have Jesus, who don't, who didn't believe in Jesus and stuff like that. Where do they go? Where where are Abraham, Isaac, all of them? Like where right do now? they go? Like, not right now, but back then, before Jesus died. The bosom. The bosom of Abraham. So back then, when people died, there was, they, were, they did go to a place for punishment. Because in the, in the book of Lazarus, it tells us that there was a place that Abraham was at. And in this place, there was... There was a, a, a cavern. I, I don't know if it's a cavern. There was a gap and there was two places. So one was uh, Abraham's bosom. So which is where Abraham, all of them were, were at. Those who had faith in the coming of Jesus Christ. Not They didn't see him coming, but they believed that he was going to come. Because, you know, in the Old Testament, God always told us that Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Like uh, even Genesis, he might not say Jesus word by word, but there's a seed who's going to crush the head of the serpent and stuff like that. He says that. So in the Old Testament, people used to go to hell. But now, not hell. Yeah, some people used to go to hell because there's the guy also but this is in discussion okay this is a debate in between theologians that they have some of them say that jesus said that parable as just uh 
He was just saying it as a story. Some of them believe that it actually is real. And some people believe that. So the Old Testament people, those who didn't believe in, in Jesus go, went straight to hell. Some who believed uh, went to the Abraham's bosom, like Abraham and the rest. And after that, there is nothing like that. Everybody sleeps and they just wake up for a judgment. But those those two points are very, very debated. And this this point right here, the people of the graves heard heard him the people in the graves heard him this is one of the points that they use to back that up so they say uh jesus went to abraham's bosom for the three days that he was dead and he brought back abraham and all of them to to god basically he brought them he took them out of hell basically as is, is what is what this uh would 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 say or this point of it would say. But it's pretty, it's conflicting. It's conflicting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say heaven. I don't know. Like personally, I, do, I, I, I don't know where he took them. I don't know where he took them. But yeah what do you guys think about this this is one of those things that not a lot of us known about even the the only two places that this is mentioned three places that this is mentioned that i can even think about is the whole story of lazarus and the beggar one this part of scripture and matthew near the end of matthew it says the graves were opened and people saw the dead rising and like like not as I don't, I'm as understanding that is not that simple, I would say. Thank you, Goldie. No worries, Icarus. Icarus, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I was saying, um, I think they went to heaven because Elijah, if I'm not wrong, wait, like, I think the Bible says he went to heaven. Your microphone is, you covered it. Oh, shit. Oh, sorry. You hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Elijah, I think the Bible says Elijah went straight to heaven. Yeah with like a, a chariot of fire if i'm not wrong mm -hmm. and then there was this verse in the bible i think in the i think in luke where jesus and the disciples went to pray in the mountain and then um the disciples fell asleep but then i think john no peter was awake and then he saw jesus sitting together with moses and uh Abraham or Elijah, I'm not sure. And then he said, uh, Master, let's hear. Yeah. So I think, uh, and they were already dead, but he saw their manifestation here on earth, sitting together with Jesus. Hmm. So I think during those days, maybe people used to go to heaven. Like uh, if you are faithful to God, maybe you used to go to heaven. And then... Uh, God probably saw that, uh, okay, as people are going to hell because of their lack of faith in him, as a way of saving humanity, I think he sent Jesus. So, yeah, okay, that's what I think. And then, okay, pass me. Thank you, Chris. Back in the days, two people went to heaven and to go to heaven back then, you couldn't even die. They, they were taken up to heaven. And those two people were Enoch and Genesis and uh, Elijah. And those are the only two people we know of that, that went to heaven. 
the only two people we know of. But earlier, Blaine, even when you asked me the question, I think I oversimplified it too much. So the answer would still be, I don't want to complicate it too much, but okay. So there are some parts of the Bible that I read that I'm like, mm, okay, so maybe our, the people don't go to heaven, they go to sleep. Because that's what Paul says, the sleep. He's talking about death, the sleep and stuff. But there are some parts that, like for example, in Revelation, there's a part where the God's altar, there's the altar and there's spirits of those who are, die, who, who are dead, who have, been, who have died for the gospel and stuff, who are under his altar. And it makes you start thinking, okay, so normal people, if people die in normal circumstances, they don't go to heaven, they sleep, okay? So are those people who, have sacrificed their life to god are they under the altar it makes you think those things and also these questions about the old testament it makes it comes up and that's like can we say they're in heaven the bible says they sleep but can we say that some of them are in heaven or not and conclusively i would say there is no evidence that says people are in heaven right now or people go to heaven right now. Even, even though, do you guys know the one who died next to Jesus? On the cross? On the cross. Yes. It says, today you will be with me in paradise. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And just like we discussed, where did Jesus go that day when he died? Abraham. Abraham's bosom. So is that paradise? No. Yes, maybe? Yeah, that's exactly the question. You see, it's, all of these things are so aloof. It's very, very hard to say. I've heard testimonies of people going to heaven, like in their like through their intimacy with God. They go to, like, even, even Paul says in the Bible, I know of a man who's went, who went to the third to the third heaven. By the way, there's different heavens and there's different hells. But I, he says that I've heard of a man who went to the third heaven. And he, he's not talking about a man who died, but he's talking about a living man and who's had an encounter with God and God took him to heaven. And, you know, show them some stuff and stuff like that. And we hear a lot about those people even today having encounters with God and going to heaven and stuff and seeing stuff and coming back. But I guess it's hard to say, do, de do, do dead people go to heaven or not? Because apart from Jesus, no one came from the dead to tell us they're in heaven or not. You know? And I'd say... Yeah, but definitely we'll do more research on that. And that's one of the hard topics to, to even analyze. But one day, like later on, on the Thursday classes on the Bible discussions, we'll bring out all of the Bible verses that talk about it. And we can actually discuss among ourselves and just see where does the Bible point. Is there people in heaven today? Or are people going to be resurrected? Okay, even about resurrection, I didn't tell you. There's the full story about the resurrection. I just don't want to complicate it and make it too complicated on you guys. But there's two resurrections. Okay? There's two resurrections. So there's the one when Jesus comes down to rule for a thousand years. Jesus comes first, not just to judge the world, but to rule for a thousand years. And then the most holy people will be resurrected. So that's the resurrection we should inspire to be part of, not the one with everybody else. When Jesus comes to rule for a thousand years, there's going to be a resurrection. And there, only the most holy people, only the most holy servants of God, only those, you know, who've lived for God in like ways, you know, like crazy ways, they will be resurrected to rule for a thousand years in earth with him. 
I would like to point us to scriptures so we can read the scriptures and even see for ourselves, but I didn't prepare on that. So sorry that I can't point you guys to the scriptures of this. But and then the second resurrection, I think it talks about the, the first and second resurrection on Second Corinthians. Uh, the second resurrection is what I said earlier, where everybody will be resurrected from the dead. Everybody will be judged in front of God. Every single human being that died. So it makes you it makes you think. If there's already people in heaven, will they be resurrected? Or would they just come down from heaven? We're given new bodies when we're resurrected after judgment. If we if we you know if we go if we are uh, believe in Christ and we pass the judgment, you know, and like we pass the trials, like not the trials, but like Jesus' judgment, he says, you believe in me, come, I will not put you to shame. Good, dot, good, well done, good and faithful servant. By the way, you don't get well done and good and faithful servant just because you believed in Jesus. You have to do your assignment, which he sent you into this earth for. After that, you even receive your spiritual bodies. And right now, like, with what bodies do we just go to heaven? With just our souls or what bodies do we have? It's a lot of questions. Uh, Icarus, continue, my friend. Yeah, sorry about this. Uh, you said you'll talk about it later, but um, I heard somewhere in Revelations sorry? I didn't hear saying about, about the resurrection. Mm. Yeah, uh, sorry to bring it up, but uh, about the first and second resurrection, I was reading in Revelations, like uh, during the first resurrection jesus will come and then all who believe in him like will rise up in glory and then we'll go to heaven and then during the second like he'll come to judge like uh the remaining now uh, judgment so I'm, I'm not sure if i was reading if uh, the version is different but that's what I was reading, like... Um, which part, in which part of Revelation is that? Yeah, let's actually, true. let's just check it out. Yeah, you, if you guys have... Is. Sorry, sorry, Chris, that I was talking about for you. Which part of Revelation is it talking yeah. about? And if, if you guys have time, let's just read it together. Yeah, let me just... Uh, um, let me check... Yeah. Okay, just a second. Let me check and then I'll, I'll let you know. Let me just. Yeah. But yeah, guys, now this is what it is. But uh, would you guys want it? like do a bible study about that like a bible discussion about heaven and hell like are people in heaven right now what are the resurrections and stuff like that kb gave a thumbs up and this time we could be using bible verses to actually back up the things that we're saying blaine gave thumb thumbs up Meh, I don't know. Not that interesting. Is a tough topic? Yes. Maybe later on, after a few more. Maybe you guys have been doing this for a while, I think. But I think I have a few more weeks to go before it. Like discussing that. Definitely. Uh, no, I mean in in of course at later time. Do you know there's there's deeper topics though we should uh, explore that have that could help us more in our Christian journey than just well is 
their heaven right now or heaven later, you know, like knowing even this will not hurt to help us in our journey. Good, I mean, later on, of course, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Uh. Yeah. Um, so on Thursday, are we going to continue like this session? Wait, it's a new No, no, no. Not, it's a, Thursdays is discussions. Monday oh. on Tuesdays is Bible readings. And Thursdays, we just talk about different things. And I think this Thursday is going to be knowing God. Oh, nice. Okay. So knowing God. Uh, and I think, uh, Icarus, what you're talking about is on Revelation uh, line 20. And it actually says, uh, is Revelation uh, chapter 20, line 6, and it actually says, Blessed and holy is the one who is part of the first resurrection. Over the second, death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. You see? Icarus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the first resurrection, the people that wake up the first resurrection, just like you said, blessed and holy is the one who's part of the first resurrection. These people are blessed and holy people of God. And this is what we need to inspire to be. We need to be part of the first resurrection. Imagine your first, like this is what I tell my friends, like that know me and I, I talk to them about these type of things. But imagine you're, you're part of the first resurrection and Jesus rules for a thousand years. And you already know Jesus for a thousand years. You know? You already know Jesus for a thousand years. Imagine you're, everybody else wakes up on the second resurrection and you're like, just already there with Jesus. You've already served him for a thousand years before anybody else. Not including your life. Your earthly life, I mean. And isn't that an honor? Isn't that the biggest honor? Like... That is my what I inspire. To, I inspire to be part of the first resurrection. I don't inspire to be part of the second resurrection. I inspire to be there in the first one. When everybody wakes up, I'm like, yo, I've been here. I've been out here with Jesus. We've been ruling the earth for a thousand years. I've been serving him for a thousand years. Not like in a in a show off, like go to way, but I'm I'm like, I know my I've been with my Lord and to be with Jesus, is there any greater like honor than that? If, there, if, if life has a point, I think it would be to serve God, honestly. But uh, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. Let's not get too lost in this. But this will be for a future, future day. We'll talk more about this. Okay, let's finish, guys. Let's finish it. Let's, oh, my God. 7.30. Dang, that's late. But let me finish. Let me read from line thirty-one to forty-seven. All right, Are you guys down for that? What was this? from since? From line thirty-one to forty-seven, and we'll quickly finish it. Okay. Let's run. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me. And I know the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent, you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be, be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light but i have greater a greater witness than john for the works which the father has given me to finish the very works that i do bear bear witness of me that the father has sent me and the father himself who sent me has testified about me you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form but you do not have his words abiding in you because whom he sent 
him do not believe whom he sent him you do not believe you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are the these are they which testify of me do you do but you are not willing to come to me then you may have life that you may have life i do not receive honor from men but i know you that you do not have the love of god in you i have come in my father's name and you do not receive me if anyone comes in his own name he will him you will receive how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from only god do not think that i shall accuse him to the father there is one who accuses you moses in whom you trust for if you believe moses you would believe me for i wrote about me for he wrote about me but if you do not believe his writings you will believe my words you will yeah but if you do not believe his writings how will you believe in my words okay guys so quick 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 about this uh, unless you guys want to say something about it first some things that you found interesting okay so let's go quickly uh what's one of the most interesting things okay so here jesus is talking about a uh, testimony of him and john testifies about him john the baptist he's testifying that jesus is the lamb of god and all of these things so john testified about him and they didn't believe him john and jesus is saying here that i don't need human testimony i don't need people to testify about me he says on line 36 yeah on line 36 i have a greater witness than john who's he talking about who's the greater witness than john let me ask you guys this question quickly for any of you guys who uh, believe like holy spirit he right here he's talking about god kb but yes also the holy spirit in what instances did did God testify about Jesus that the Holy Spirit testify about Jesus what when Jesus in what instances uh in when didn't, Jesus was, didn't, okay didn't John the Baptist also testify about Jesus yeah that's we said yeah he did testify about Jesus but people didn't believe him and Jesus doesn't even need human testimony John the Baptist was a human Jesus doesn't even need human testimony God the Father testified about him what when he was getting baptized in Matthew 3 mm. as the, the the heavens opened up and God said this is my son whom I'm well pleased you guys so God even testified about Jesus and who else testified about Jesus the holy spirit the holy spirit fell on him like a dove and this even was testimony about Jesus Christ so both God the Father and and the holy spirit testified about jesus and this is very very interesting because in deuteronomy 11 let me read it real quick in deuteronomy 11 line 15 and i will yo this man no in deuteronomy okay no not Deuteronomy 11 I think it's numbers maybe but in 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 one of the books of the old testament I think it's Deuteronomy or numbers says that uh for testimony to be acceptable you need to have two or three one testimony is not acceptable two testimonies you can take it up to that law that's acceptable for you to use two testimonies but three testimonies I mean uh but yeah three testimonies is 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 very good and that's how it is so 
John the Baptist testified about Jesus. But human testimony doesn't even matter. The Holy Spirit and God testified about Jesus, about who Jesus is. You see? And I say this to people a lot, but when you preach about God to people, why isn't it working? It's because there is this law that testimony, your testimony, when we testify about Jesus Christ to people, when we do it alone, it's not going to work. It's not going to work when we do it alone. It says that there needs to be at least two to three witnesses for your, for, for, for your testimony to even be accepted. So this law still occurs even in the back of people's heads. So when you testify about Jesus, the reason your testimony is not working, the reason what you're saying is not clicking to people is because you're doing it alone. You need the Holy Spirit. You need assistance, the Holy Spirit. Who else do you need? You need God. How do they testify through you? The Holy Spirit is in you and it guides conversations. It stares up people. You speak. You even sometimes you prophesy. You do these different things. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus with you and that touches the heart of people. God testifies with you through signs and wonders. Jesus over here, he... Uh, I changed the chapters, but he says the works that he does through me. Those also are testimonies of, of, of from God to Jesus. When when uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus, he was like, the things, the works that you do only come from God. And he even understand that God testifies that Jesus is his. He's sent by him. So. Think about this. If the things you're saying to people aren't working, if what you're, you're speaking to them about God and it's not clicking, two things. Testimony from the Holy Spirit. That's where it starts. You need to grow in more intimacy with the Holy Spirit. So when you talk, the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. And the second thing, after you grow in intimacy with the Holy Spirit, then you start, God even starts testifying about you. He starts testifying through signs and wonders, you through doing miraculous healings, you through doing these things. God starts testifying about you. But yeah, guys, that's what we got for today. Thank you guys for coming. And I'm sorry, today was very, that was very, very long, right? Sorry about that, guys. I got carried away by the first part. It's okay, Oli. Bye, guys. Thank Bye, you. Buddy. Bye. Thank you. You want to pray for us or? Oh, yeah. Let me pray you guys out real quick. Sorry. KB, thank you for reminding me. Or if anybody else wants to pray. I can pray. Okay, KB, sure. Father God, thank you for bringing us here to learn about you, to know to know you more, to discuss your word. Father God, as as we have read today, you help us understand what you want us to understand. You help us walk in the way you want us to walk, Father God. Don't let us sit and wait like the 38-year-old 38, 38 crippled man, Father God. Um, I beg you to to give us more understanding, more wisdom. I beg you to give Odi more understanding, more wisdom. Father God, um, bless Odi. Bless Blaine and Yanit. And um watch over us in the rest of our day in jesus name we pray amen thank you kb thank you. thank you guys for joining amen thank you guys thank you